Good evening. Tonight's recording is going to be about how we trace errors in iterative code. So the learning goal for tonight's video is by the end, you'll be able to systematically test programs for errors. So first, let's recap on what we've actually looked at in relation to errors. There's four types of errors. First, we have the syntax error. The syntax error is basically the grammar. You've got the words and all the symbols wrong, or one of the words and symbols wrong. The compiler will pick it up and will give you a message in the bottom when you try to run your program. The next one is a runtime. So while the grammar might be correct, there is something wrong with the way the program is put together. Again, the compiler will pick this up when it gets run and a message will appear in your console down the bottom. The next two are a bit trickier, logic and intent. Logic is where you got all the code correct and you're running, the program's running, but it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's doing something different and you need to work out why it's doing something different. And that's a logic, uh, logic problem because it's not doing what you think, it's, you think it wanted to do. Finally, the intent problem. The intent problem is when you've got a program which is working perfectly, it is doing exactly what you have told it to do, what you intended it to do, but unfortunately this is not what the client wants. So you effectively have misunderstood your brief, you misunderstood your problem and you've solved a different problem. The logic and intent errors are the most difficult errors to identify and find. And today we're gonna to focus really on trying to get this logic one down. We're really gonna focus on logic and working out what we need to do to identify logic errors. So basically to identify logic, we need to systematically test all the possibilities. Now we've done that with our branching logic. So if you have multiple pathways, you need to be able to go down all those pathways and make sure that they all execute as you intended them to execute. So you have to go about identifying what all the possible paths are and um, put the solutions um, in. You need to be able to test for all the expected and unexpected values. So you've got to allow for the fact that people might be not highly intelligent or not understand what they're supposed to be putting in and will put in the wrong answers. So how do we do that? How do we identify an error location? How do we do this? So there's two ways. Um, basically it's table testing. So, well, it's one way, it's called table testing. And what table testing is, is that basically you're running the program on paper and you're stepping it through and making sure that you are getting the solution that you anticipate. So tabletop testing is quite simple. First off, you record all the expected values of the different variables throughout the actual program and how they will change. Then you manually run the actual program and you update the, the values of the variables throughout in your table. You sit down and you make the changes as it be. And then finally, um, you use the print command to check where the error is. So if you get to the end of your actual testing and the variables that actually are produced are not the variables that your tabletop testing said should be produced, then you need to insert print commands throughout the actual program to identify where exactly the error is occurring and where those variables are not changing in the way that you anticipated. So here's an example of a tabletop test. I've got a really simple for loop here, which intends to sum the numbers between one and five inclusive. So the numbers one, two, five, add them all up as it goes through. So I'm starting with a total here. I have a total value and then total variable, which is an integer. I then have a for loop, which is going to go with the index of number one, and it goes from the range of one to five. Um, and then each time it goes through this loop, its um, total is going to be itself plus whatever number the range is. So one, two, three, four, and five. In the end, we want to print total. So what we have, if you look over here, I've, I've drawn up my table. If you look over here and in the table, you can see that um, I've got the initial variable value. So initially, the initial area up here, when it starts, is this here the number or num1 is worth nothing it doesn't actually exist and total equals zero now we talk about the different passes one two three four these are the passes of the loop so for the first pass of the loop so if we run through this loop one time for the first pass at the end 
num will equal one and total will equal one because I've added zero. I've added zero plus one to give me a value of one. Okay, then second pass through. So the loop then passes through the second time and num is now two. So I add one and two together to give me three. Third pass through, three and three should give me, three and three should give me six. Um, next pass through, six and four should give me 10. And the next pass four is 10 and five, which gives me 15. So I've added one, two, three, four, and five together to give me a total of 15. That's how I intend, that's how I want the actual program to run. Now, the only problem I've got is that when I run this code, this is my result. I get 10, which is not the 15 that I anticipated I was gonna get. So I now need to go back and work out why it is that I didn't get the answer that I was after. Where is the logic problem in that um, programming? Now this is a fairly simple example. So you might be able to straight up see that, well here, this is the answer it was given me. So we've probably missed this line here. But what I wanna do is actually show you a process you go through to actually show you exactly what happens. So what we've done is I've inserted this line here. And what it's going to do is that for each pass, it will print out num, well, a string, num1, and actually the value of num1, and then the string total, and the value of total. And so I will see as it goes through each loop what the actual value of the variables are as they go through each loop. And this is a response I get. So I can see that, yep, first pass it goes through, second pass it goes through, third pass it goes through, fourth pass, and then it stops. So pass five doesn't stop. And this is a point where I slap myself in the head and go, that's right, because range, if I wanna go one to five, I've got to go for a number more. So it has to be N plus one. So if I want five, I have to actually make that six. So I'll make the changes to six and it will run through and will give me the value of 15. But really important, printing to console is really, really useful for this. It gives you an understanding of what's actually happening to the variables. Um, and you can use it for a lot of different ways. If you're wondering whether a program runs into a particular um, branch of an if statement, you can just put a print statement in there and have it appear and say, yes, I'm here. Um, so the print to console statements are really useful for that. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go to here. So here's another little situation for you is uh, this little activity that I want you guys to do. So it's going to be a total is zero um, and you've got two loops. You've got one inside the other here. And the first one is going to num one and num two. So you're gonna run through from one to six, well, one to five as we now know. And then for num two, from one to five. And then with this nested for loops in here, the process is gonna see total plus num1 plus num2 and then print the total. And what I want you to do is to make a table up and step yourself through that actual process and see what you can come up with. And to do so, I want you to press pause and I'm just gonna wait 10 seconds and put the answer up. So press pause now, do the work. And then when you think you've got a solution, come back and check it out. Make sure you're pressing pause. And welcome back. Okay, so here is the actual solution. Well, part of the solution, it goes down through here. And this is where I actually, in nested, I like using the, um, the dots to show which particular pass it's going through. So the very first pass, we come down here initially num1 and num2 are worth nothing and total is set initiated to zero then we say okay let's go down and have a look uh, for num1 the first pass the first pass is here here and here at this point at this point the first time through num1's value is one and num2's value is one so add those two together if you two now we come to the end of this loop end of this 
loop here and we come back to this for loop, the second for, uh, the inside for loop. So at 1.2 at this stage, num2 is increased, num num2 is increased, num1 hasn't. So it's past 1.2. Num1 is 1, num2 is 2, and the answer is 5 because we're adding 1 and 2 to the previous value of total, which is 2. So again, we come back over here and you change color. Come back over here again to this four range, and we find out that um, one is num one is still one, num two is three, and one and three to five, and that will give you nine. And again, next time we've got we've done this, we go back here because we still haven't hit six yet. We haven't hit five yet. So one, so num2, well num1 is still 1, num2 is now 4, so 1 and 4 plus 9 equals 14. Okay, so finally, and we just cook some around our color, come back to here, back up here at green, and we say num1 is still 1, num2 is 5, 1 and 5 and 14 equals 20. Nice arrow there. Anyhow, so once we've done that, we've now come back up here and because num2 is 5, it hits this, exit out of this loop, exit out of this loop and goes back up to the next loop in which num1 will increase up to 2, num1, num2 return back to 1, 1, and then we keep adding the value to total and so forth. So I hope that makes sense. And it's really important to be able to do this, especially with nested loops, because it can get quite tricky trying to keep a track of all the values in your head. Okay, gentlemen, well, we'll see you tomorrow morning where we can do an application of this. Good evening.